Okay. Okay, folks. So I see we've got a couple of people have joined us already this evening. As you are joining us, I want to let you know we are hosting tonight um, Adam Lanningham. He is um, works with Sang right now. He's the president elect for Sang and has been on the board of directors for the Arizona Association for Gifted and Talented. Also a founding member of Callisto, which is a support group, um, a sub group supporting gifted foster youth and has been an advisor for COGAT, Riverside Insights. If you are in gifted ed, you know COGAT. <laughs> so um, we are excited to have him tonight um, to talk to us about trauma and giftedness. So without further ado, I want to hand it right over to Adam and let you get the ball rolling. Thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Looks like it is behaving. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, it, it's kind of a light topic for this evening, but we are talking about gifted and trauma. Um, we're going to talk about different types of trauma tonight, just so you kind of understand what, we what we're talking about when we say trauma, as well as give you some practical strategies that you can use at home or in your classroom to help our gifted kiddos. Let's see. All right. So I, when I do a presentation, always like to just start with a story. So when talking about trauma, I, one of my former students comes to mind. Um, I was a teacher for many years, and at one of the campuses, uh, before I went to district office, I was a gifted specialist, which meant that um, I supported all grade levels and helped all of the teachers working with gifted students. And I had one student, she was a fourth grader, and um, wonderful gifted student, no issues or concerns. Uh, but one day it, it kind of surprised me. So I was at a kindergarten through eighth grade school, which means I got the fun duties like going and you know corralling parents in the parking lot at drop off and those kinds of fun things. And um, so one morning I was you know one of the last people in closing the gates, um, walking down to my class, and I saw this lump in front of my door. And as I'm walking closer, I realize it's a student with a backpack and just under, you know, um, their coat and all of this stuff. And I walked up and it was Jenny. And I'm like, what's going on? Sobbing, couldn't even talk. Um, I'm like, oh my gosh, okay, you know, come on in. I let her go sit in the corner of my room. You know, I had the nice like cozy corner with the bean bags and the books and things like that. And poor thing just couldn't even talk. So called her homeroom teacher, don't mark her absent. She's with me for a little bit. I'll let you know later what's going on. It was a good while before she was ready to talk about what had happened. And in between that, I had small groups of kids in and out and back and forth. And she just, you know, stayed in the corner. The packet of work came from the homeroom teacher. I just set that aside, was not showing her that. And a bit later, I walked up to her and I could tell she was kind of moving around. I'm like, honey, what, what happened? And of course, I'm waiting for, you know, my parents are fighting. There was a death in the family. She saw a dead bird on the way to school. And at first, I'm like, what? I thought she was kidding me, but it, it just sent her down a path where she just was not able to function. Um, and I like to start this presentation just to kind of give you guys idea, an idea of what some of these gifted kids go through due to their sensitivities and things. So it, Maddie ended up, or Jenny ended up being just fine, um, called her parents, told her, you know, what happened. And the mom's like, oh yes, there's, you, you know, to, we get a lot of this at home. It was the first time I saw this at school. And she ended up being okay. But the, what I like to share about that is she was not ready to learn that day. And I was not gonna force her into anything um, as far as whatever tests or assignments or homework. And I, I like to share that just so we, we kind of put things in per, into perspective. These are kids, you know, they're, they're human beings. They don't always follow our schedule. If they're not ready for something, sometimes they're just not ready for something. And Jenny had to work through that that day and she was good to go after a while, but 
just just interesting and something again to kind of put things into perspective. Um, so wonderful intro about me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I have been a teacher for many years. Uh, started at the middle school, kind of worked my way down to elementary. Uh, the joke was eventually I'd be a kindergarten teacher, and I didn't end up working with kindergarten kids for a while. Um, I was at multiple schools then. Um, I went to the district level, worked there for seven years, built many, many different programs and services. I am not a fit in the box kind of guy, and I didn't expect my teachers or schools to do the same either. So we did very unique programs and services based on what the kids and communities needed. Um, so that was why I ran away this summer. And now I focus on these kinds of things. Um, I do um, advising and PDs and consulting, things like that. So um, in addition to that kind of stuff, which I do under my own company, Bright Child, um, I'm also president-elect of Sang. Um, Sang is a wonderful group that's international. If you haven't heard about it, I um, encourage you to go on the website. I think I have the link on my next slide. Um, but again, focusing on social emotional needs. That um, group was founded actually in Arizona. It's an international group. And the man who started it was a psychologist. And one of his clients, a gifted teenager, ended up committing suicide back in 1981. And he started this whole group to try to bring the awareness and support for these kids, that whole piece that a lot of people don't see or think about when they think of gifted. Um, so again, I help with AEGT, lots of other stuff. I write books. I'll talk about a couple of them tonight. Um, I did want to do a shout out for Sing. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, Sing is partnering with a lot of other organizations such as CAGT and uh, providing different, um, what I want to say, programs, events, and things to try to highlight and bring awareness to Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, we do have more information on our website. You can go on there, free newsletter. We have our conference coming up in July, Villanova, which is outside of Philadelphia. Information on that is on the website. We do have a virtual option. Um, if you are able to attend in person, one of the thing that, things that makes the same conference very unique is it's a family event. We encourage you to bring your kids. We have programs for kids through young adults who get to go to a field trip out to one of the museums in Philadelphia. So lots of cool things going on with the same. So with that, um, my goal for you this evening is after my presentation, hopefully there's something new that you've learned, something more that you want to explore more about, or you at least just got a better understanding of your students or your children. So kind of the timeline of where we're going, I'm gonna talk a bit about where my book came from. Again, I was kind of like talked into writing it. I never thought I would be talking about a book I wrote. Uh, we're gonna talk about trauma specifically four kinds. And I know trauma has been in the news a lot. There's a lot of, not a lot, but th there is, some confusion on what we mean by that and those kinds of things. So we'll chat about that. And then I'll talk about 20 things that not only help kids who've gone through trauma, but also help kids who are gifted. So if we're in person, I would do a crazy stories with holes because I hate icebreakers. If you've ever seen them, the guy Nathan Levy, he's the one who talked me into writing a book to start with. He writes these, they're great, like lateral thinking puzzles and things for kids. So I always kind of give a shout out because. Those are amazing. So this is not my book. This is the book that sparked my interest in writing a book. So many years ago, I was at an Arizona gifted conference and I ran into the crazy guy named Nathan Levy and brought him back to do some training and work with some of my teachers. So we have a large district, over 40 schools, and it was me and a part-time clerk. Um, so I got to do all of the training and testing and all of those kinds of things. So occasionally there was money and I could bring someone in to help me. So I brought Nathan in and he was helping doing trainings and he sat in and watched me do trainings. And he's like, you need to do this. You need to write a book. You need to do this. I'm like, no, 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 no. Well, over the next couple of years, he harassed me via email and phone call and things with different ideas and things that he's come across. Well, one time he sent me the manuscript to this book. And I'm like, why are you sending me a trauma book? 
And he's like, just read it. Let me know what you think. I'm like, fine, okay. Well, so me, it's hard for me to sit down and read a whole book at one time, but I did this one. Uh, my brain wanders and too many things get in the way, but I actually sat down and read this book all the way through. And two things really stood out to me as someone who manages programs for gifted children. One, the fascinating things that we're learning about the brain and how it works and functions. And we'll talk a bit about that tonight. And then the second one was the what they talked about, the different strategies or things that uh, Nathan and Melissa talk about how to help kids who've been through trauma. Those strategies were very similar to what I was already teaching my teachers to support gifted kids, that whole social emotional piece. I still don't know the full connection there. I have some ideas and why that is the case. We'll talk a bit about it. But those things stood out to me and I'm like, this is fascinating. And we wrote the gifted version up. So starting with trauma tonight, uh, these are the four kinds we're gonna talk about. We'll spend a little bit more time on some than others. Um, but the first one, secondary trauma, then single event trauma, developmental trauma, and then gifted neglect trauma. And that is an Adam thing. If you see that anywhere else, somebody took it because I kind of coined that phrase. Um, but so as we start talking about trauma, ASCD is a great resource. Um, there's links here, but you can Google it, go on their website. There's lots of research coming out about trauma. And what really surprised me was secondary impact trauma is a thing. And I'm like, okay, but here's the new thing on trauma. No, they've been studying it for quite some time. And what secondary impact trauma is, is when someone else has been going through a traumatic experience and those who help them or are with them start getting impacted by that as well, okay? So if you think of police officers, the things they see, doesn't necessarily happen to them necessarily, or paramedics, nurses, Okay, uh, they go, they see a lot of trauma, even though it's not impacted necessarily on specifically, and it can start taking its toll. So when we start talking about kids, this information came out before the pandemic. So I wrote my book in 2019. Um, and this information came out a little after that. But again, before the pandemic, over half of all children in the United States have been through some kind of trauma. Okay. So they're in our classrooms. Depending on where you are, they may be more than half, right? Um, what exactly is it? Again, it, I'm not gonna read this to you, um, but again, it's we as the helpers, the educators are kind of exposed to these other children's trauma and how it's impacting them. Uh, the number one career field with an impact, can anyone guess? educators, okay, number one, okay, kind of makes sense to me. I know years ago, I got someone, some people were trying to talk me into being a school counselor, and I'm like, there's no way. I won't be able to sleep in. I just know myself. So I bring this up to kind of help you guys understand, yes, it's out there. We need to, as professionals, do what's best for kids, but also be mindful of taking care of ourselves. So again, I'm not going to read everything on these slides, but ASCD is a great resource. Uh, we talked a bit about that. And again, a lot of it, the first step is being aware of it. Okay. And then making sure that you are doing things to kind of have balance in your life, make sure work stays at work. And I was the first person to be guilty of that, taking work home on, on over the weekends, going to school in the dark, coming home in the dark. Um, but again, just take a minute to take some time for you guys, walk your pets, doodle, do art, exercise. I'd put a wine glass up there, but I don't know if that's appropriate. Um, but again, it, it, especially these days, I've seen so many amazing teachers leave the profession it's just heartbreaking. Um, so we get it. It's difficult. Be mindful of the stress. Okay. Make sure you're taking time for yourselves. 
The next uh, type of trauma we're going to talk about is going to be very brief. It's the single event trauma. So I put up this picture. Um, if this were to happen to you, chances are you might be a little hesitant getting back into a car right away, but eventually you will. You'll realize it was an accident. What are the odds? Generally, we're okay. Most people can go through an accident. They're able to still function, be okay. That's not a focus tonight. One of the main focuses tonight is the developmental trauma. And this is trauma that happens over a period of time, okay? So emotional trauma, high poverty, uh, racism, sexual abuse. You can add lots of things here that aren't even here. I would argue twice exceptionalism. Having a kid who's truly twice exceptional go through the school system can be incredibly traumatic. Um, separations, those kinds of things. And, and what's interesting is we are seeing this happens and it does impact the brain. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, but we still don't know how two people can go through the same trauma and one pretty much be good and the other really struggle with it for years, if not the rest of their life. Things can happen to twins and it's the same kind of thing. We're also starting to see separation at birth. Children who are given up, they, the babies know their mothers and that has an impact. We still don't know why for some it has more of an impact than others, but we do know it does. And there's a high chance that they're gonna take a, a lot of time to get through some of these things. So when we're talking about developmental trauma, it's a big change, a big impact in the negative, generally over a period of time, okay? So what we're starting to realize is it's impacting our brains when we go through trauma. And again, we don't know why some people it impacts more than others, but we're not gonna spend the whole night talking about parts of the brain and different things, but just an overview. On this image, you can see we have the frontal cortex, your frontal lobe forehead. That's your logic and reasoning, okay? Deep down in your brain, you have your hippocampus, hippocampus uh, which is your emotional regulations and those kinds of things. And way deep in there is the amygdala, okay? When I went to school, it was the reptilian brain. Okay, it's you know what you need to survive. Okay. So in the book, okay, uh, Melissa and Nathan talk about Theo. And Theo, so Melissa's a psychologist. She adopted Theo from a Romanian orphanage. Okay. When he, I want to say was six or seven. Needless to say, there was a lot of trauma that impacted him. And her she is a psychologist, really had to go through this journey, even her and her expertise and knowledge to really help him. Um, one of the things that they did, so Melissa, Dr. Satan saw this firsthand, as they were going through and just trying to help Theo and realize what triggers him, what's going on in his brain, because again, she wants to know, um, they did some brain scans and things. Well, one of the tests that they did is they took both Melissa and Theo and they figured out what they were afraid of or what would trigger them, okay? So if you are someone who's gone through trauma, something could trigger memories of that trauma. It could be something visual, like what we're gonna talk about. It could be a sound, it could be a smell, who knows, but something can trigger someone who's been through traumatic experience. And what they were trying to figure out is for them, what part of the brain's working? Is it any different than someone who hasn't been through trauma? So Melissa hasn't been through any trauma. They tested her, they figured out what she's gonna be frightened of, of image. Same thing with Theo. They strapped them down and scanned their brain activity and started showing them pictures, okay? Well, sure enough, they didn't include one that they knew would upset them. So these pictures are their brains. One is Melissa's and one is Theo's. At this moment in time, they are being shown something that 
they know they would be scared of, or in Theo's case, trigger him to react. Now, when you're looking at these, it's as if you're laying down, the top part is your frontal cortex. So you're leaning back, and this picture is being scanned of their brain. The yellow is active, red is very active. I'll let you think for a second and try to figure out who is who. Again, these pictures, one's Theo who's been through trauma and was having serious issues at the time. And the other one's Melissa who wasn't. And this is like a top down view. So the top is their forehead. So if we were in person, I like to see who thinks what, and usually I get about a 50-50. Um, but the one, and again, I can't point, I could point to my screen here, but it's not gonna help you. The one with far more red is Melissa's, okay? And that makes sense when you realize where is a lot of the red happening? It's her frontal lobe. Remember what the frontal lobe does, logic and reasoning. So she's being shown this image, whatever it is, a burglar, a lion, whatever. And she's reacting, it's not pleasant, but she's not being totally triggered and can't control herself. Her logic and reasoning kicks in. It's like, okay, this is a picture. Theo, on the other hand, yeah, there's some activity going on there, but not compared to someone who hasn't been through trauma and where is most of the red? The amygdala, okay? Which that, again, is your survival brain. So children, adults who have gone through trauma, okay? And something triggers them, they fall into fight or flight, okay? So this is where, you know, student may dive under the desk. A chair might get thrown. They're being triggered and their brain is not working as their typical age peer would be to kind of bring them back to understand the situation through logic and reason, okay? So as a teacher, I just find that fascinating. Um, one of the things, and this has been out on the internet quite a bit, I've seen in the last few years, um, something to just kind of help you remember, because we're working with kids and we all know in the school system, we don't get all the information on every child coming in that room um, for whatever reason, but, something could set off a child who's been through trauma. We may not know why, how, what the thing is, but they're gonna react. And one of the ways to think about it is if you put your thumb in your hand and fold your fingers down, it kind of forms your brain. Okay, when a child who's been through trauma is triggered, they flip their lid, which is the frontal cortex. And what do they have to think with? Rip, ripped survival brain. So. That's kind of a bit about developmental trauma. What I find interesting as well, I mean, all of this I found interesting, of course, I took it and wrote a gifted version of the book, but the when you look at asynchronous development of gifted children, one of the parts of the brain that usually does show up having a delay, can anyone guess what part of the brain can be delayed in gifted kids? The frontal lobe. Okay, so gifted children, we've learned, we all knew their brain was a little different, but our technology is helping us now. Their brain is developing different parts at different rates when compared to their typical age peers. And for gifted kids, the frontal lobe, many times, not every gifted kid, but many times can be up to four years delayed, especially when you get to upper elementary school. Maybe part of the reason why I liked teaching middle school. Um, they're fun. So again, just the overview, frontal cortex, important, okay? The last bit of trauma we're gonna talk about before we start getting into some more strategies and things is what I would call gift and neglect trauma. And this is kind of what got me into gifted without really knowing at the time why or what. So many years ago, I was teaching at um, another K-8 school. I was teaching middle school. 
I was teaching uh, social studies and language arts. And I was with seventh and eighth graders. The K-6 kids would feed into us. And there was a gifted program. And um, the kids coming out of the gifted program all got dumped and scattered into the classes with everybody else. And um, it, it was just interesting to me because I always love the kids and get to know their personalities and whatnot. But I started to notice that a lot of the kids coming out of the gifted program, let's just say were similar, okay? They all did school well. They all had very involved parents, um, a lot of girls. Um, and they were great. They were smart, wonderful kids. They enjoyed our activities and things. But we also would get students not coming out of the gifted program who, let's just say they got my dark English humor, they got my sarcasm, and I mean, which is they were pretty darn smart. They could problem solve. Um, that was back at the time where like our history book was literally a quarter of an inch thick, so that didn't get used and I was getting creative and we're doing simulations and activities and all kinds of things. So they participated. They love the activities, the discussions. They would do some of the projects, typically not any of the regular homework. But these kids, particularly boys, okay, they were pretty darn smart, at least as smart as the other kids coming out of the gifted program. And I'm like, this just, this doesn't make sense. Um, and well, of course they were awful for subs and some of the other teachers and things like that. I had to threaten them every time I was out. But um, it, it just sat in the back of my head, like, okay, there's something here. A couple years later, our district started offering free gifted courses and I started to go. And I'm like, ah, that was it. These kids, for whatever reason, way back in their schooling, were never identified for gifted services. So, and again, I am now an advisor for Coquat Riverside and I have vented at them many times, probably why they asked me to work with them a little bit. Um, but these kids, for whatever reason, now being, you know, coming out of being a manager for many schools, I know probably a lot of the reasons, but for whatever reason, they weren't identified for giftedness, gifted testing. Maybe their parents didn't know, the teachers didn't know, maybe there were some stereotypes with what we thought gifted was, um, probably a little all of the above. And they went through school year after year after year not having their needs met. Year after year of worksheets passing in front of their desks, knowing that they're beyond it, they get it, but nobody, I'm not going to say is bothered to check, but I'm not blaming teachers. I'm a huge teacher advocate. I consider myself one still, but they didn't know, overwhelmed, whatever. The education for the teachers and the parents just wasn't there to identify these kids. And what happens to them after these years of not having their needs met, they realized school is not for them. Um, and by the time they got to me at middle school, it's kind of late. You know, I'm one teacher out of six. And what are we going to do? Some habits are baked in and they know school's not for them. And hormones are now raging and you cross their fingers when they go to high school. But um, moving on to the district level, that was one of the things that I really pushed as well, is making sure that we had true gifted programs in the high schools. Not all gifted kids are ready for AP. It's a great program, advanced courses, but sometimes gifted kids just need to be a little bit more creative. A lot of times the gifted kids don't care about the test. They just want to learn. So anyway, that's where I kind of coined the phrase gift and neglect trauma. These poor kids year after year. Whoa. We missed them. Um, could that become some form of developmental trauma? I don't know, but I do know it impacts kids. I've seen it. Okay. Um, what we are also starting to know is that gifted kids are, do have a higher dropout rate, not dramatic, but higher than average. They are more likely to commit self-harm and even commit suicide. And I don't want to dwell too much on this, but yes, it does happen and people aren't talking about it as much as they should. Um, 
So what's really frightening though, so that alone, okay. And again, we'll get on to some stuff a little lighter here, but we still don't do a great job identifying gifted kids. I found very few places that do an amazing job, really making a priority, identify these kids, use multiple measures. If you didn't do well on one test on one day, but you're still showing potential, we can give you some chances and to get some more enriching curriculum. We're not doing a great job at identifying these kids. So the little bits of data that we're getting that's starting to show this, it's worse than what we're seeing because we're not catching all the kids. Okay, so that's why social and emotional is so important. So in my book, I collaborated with Nathan and Melissa because they wrote, they brought in the trauma piece at the time. I was the gifted person. They were the trauma people and we collaborated on this. Um, let's see how much time we have. About half an hour plus questions. So there are 20 things. I am not going to get into all of the 20 things, but I will go over many of them, okay? We kind of summarize them through this uh, presentation. Um, and we'll talk about some of the ones that when I am doing it live, lots of people ask for. So I'll give you a second to look at the overview and then we'll start through them. And if we get to the questions and you want me to come back and talk about one, for sure, we can. And I'll go through fairly quickly so we have time. Um, so one and two, I do like to talk about the first one a lot. So please don't use the G word with me. And by that, we mean gifted, okay? So we can bring in a bunch of gifted gurus, have a discussion, and probably have a pretty hard time narrowing down and having a full agreement on what giftedness is. Are we talking academics? Can we include talents? Those kinds of things are pretty like the, what do I want to say? The experts tend to talk about. Um, what about teachers who don't have gifted endorsements and fully understand gifted? What about parents who they're just hearing gifted for the first time? What does that mean? Okay. Well, then we're using that with the kids. So the adults could probably have some different disagreements over it. The parents may or may not know about it. They might have some preconceptions because a lot of the gifted parents still that I hear out there think that means good at school. Okay, not necessarily. So the term gifted, I understand we need the term gifted and that kind of falls into the labeling. We need to label these kids in order to get funding. Back when I was a district manager, it all meant staffing. Um, but when we start using the word gifted, we have to be very careful and really define what it means because there's a lot of misconceptions about it, especially for a child who now just gets, boom, you're labeled gifted. What does that mean? Does that mean school should be easy? Does that mean I should be good at everything? No, you can be gifted in one area. Imagine these twice exceptional kids who have a serious deficit in one area and are gifted in one. So we really need to think about it. If we're going to use the term gifted that comes with a whole bunch of education that the adults not only have to learn about, but that the kids do too. Um, I found a few schools that really do a good job of it, but they spend a lot of time on it, that education piece of what it is. And I mean, it comes down simply to, I was always the one doing the testing, whether it be the district level or school level. And it was, you know, giving out those, you know, lovely letters, some were good and some were not, and trying to talk to kids about gifted testing. This is just to see how your brain works and make sure that you go into a class next year that best fits with how your brain works. Let's not think about a label. So if you're gonna use the G word, Please back it up with education. Don't just assume your children or students know, because a lot don't, okay? Um, and I kind of touched a little bit on the labeling, just because we label it now gifted, things happen. Well, not necessarily, so. Um, let's see, I'll jump to number four. This, I, I, it still pops up and it, it 
it really bothers me. So a lot of parent or teachers think, okay, this kid gets through all of the work quickly. Now they can help me pass out papers, help me organize, help me run, you know, errands. And hopefully we're past letting kids grade other kids work. I think that was more when I was in school. But that's all fine and good. I think as part of a classroom environment, when you're trying to make sure that the kids have are included and have responsibilities, that we do have these kinds of tasks that kids get to share and rotate around. Every child should get to be the paper passer for that week or be, as we called it when I had a classroom, the teacher's aid for the week. You get to do all the special things and help out. But for one kiddo to get to do it all the time, just because they get through their work quickly, how much learning knowledge is being lost day after day, week after week, by the end of the year? Okay. Probably quite a bit. And one of my big emphasis were we, kids come to school and expect a full day of learning regardless of whatever label they're, whatever um, level they're at. So if the child's ready to move quickly through material, they should be able to do that. If a tire, if a child it knows this information but can go more in depth on a different aspect on it, that is great in what they should be doing. If a child needs to be retaught or remediated, that's what we should be doing. But being just the teacher's aid, it's good for every kid to experience but not one child all the time. That's probably weeks of learning loss by the end of the year. So just think about it. Let's see. I'll talk a bit about five. I do a whole presentation. This one always comes up and it, it makes sense. Writing is sometimes hard for me. Um, I have a whole presentation. I'll probably do a book on it one of these days. But when you think about it, it makes sense that gift, a lot of gifted kids will struggle with writing. So we like to put gifted kids in a box. It's really hard to do that. They don't all fit into a box. But many gifted kids struggle with writing. Many are gifted at writing, but a lot of kids struggle. And this I hear from parents and teachers consistently, and I, I would say, fought with when I was a teacher. Um, when you think about their brain, it makes sense. If their brain is developing asynchronously, different parts are developing at different times, Frontal lobe may be coming in line a little late. Um, think of a gifted brain just in general, the amount of connections that they're able to do, how fast they're able to process, the crazy ideas that they like to do since they can see the big picture a bit better than a lot of their typical age peers. Um, they're going to have a hard time organizing all of that. And writing is a very complex and emotional task when you think about it. So we're asking a child to take everything going on, direct it onto a piece of paper. Okay, so one, getting through the brainstorming of what's going on in their brain is going to be a barrier in many cases, because they're going to have lots of crazy ideas. Okay, but then the brain hand coordination is going to be another issue for many of them. My hand still can't keep up with my brain. Typing, whatever. Text to speech, I'm a bit better. I get interesting spelling that way. But we, it makes sense that, yes, your brain's going faster. Well, for a gifted kid who's developing, there are going to be lots of issues with that. Add on to that comes some kind of social and emotional piece where I will tell you, as I've talked to people all over the country and worked with so many kids and parents, one of the few commonalities I will tell you with gifted kids, they are more sensitive. I have not come across a gifted child who is not sensitive. They may not be communicating it to you, but they are. They're very observant. They think about things in multiple ways, make connections, and they are more sensitive. So when they now have to go through this process, organizing their brain, writing it down, then they're going to get judged on it. It, it a lot of them shut down and will not <laughs> contribute to writing. So some things real quick that help. I always had my kids have the spiral notebooks. I bought tons of those at the beginning of the year, you know, 10 for a dollar at Target or whatever. I had stacks and stacks and stacks. And they were just their brain dump journals. 
write down your thoughts, write down your thoughts, clear your head. If this is your writing topic, which I always did weird, crazy, interesting writing topics, you know, to kind of tempt them into writing. Then it was a lot of time spent on the brainstorming and clearing it all out. Then going through and picking the pieces that make sense, get the crazy ideas out of the way. Okay. And they would just go through these spiral notebooks, but it really helped that brainstorming piece. Another thing that really helped with, um, and again, I'm gonna talk about sometimes typing helps. Sometimes it's more of a hindrance because I think it's more fun. Typing, if you think that's gonna be a solution, they need to spend time and practice typing. Otherwise it's the same issue, finding the keys. Um, another thing was when um, I taught, was I teaching fifth grade at the time? And I taught a group of gifted with other teachers and things. And um, we did writing assignments and we graded them with the students every week. So we worked out our schedule. We had the afternoons on Wednesdays and I'd pull up the kids say, kid and at my desk writing conference, let's sit down and go through this together. At first they were terrified, but actually sitting down and seeing it with the person who's reading it and not seeing any weird judgment, but the kids would find the mistakes before I would half the time and correct them. And that's good. That's part of the process. Um, by the end of the year, that was the biggest thing the parents and kids both said they learned so much is that's hard for a teacher to do, but do we need to do big, long writing assignments every single week? No, pick and choose. If a kid is struggling, make it shorter. Focus on the important parts. But sitting down and giving that meaningful feedback where it's not just turned into a bin and comes back with red marks and what am I supposed to do with that? I think even us as adults would hate to do a lesson plan, turn it into a principal and have it come back with red all over it. Um, so again, just think through that. All right, I need to speed this up, don't I? Uh, let's go into the next one. Just because I'm smart does not mean I'm organized. Frontal lobe, asynchronous development. Sometimes I just know things. Yes, sometimes the child just knows how to solve that math problem. They soaked it up somewhere and they can't piece it together to give it back to you, but they did. These gifted kiddos, especially the younger ones, they're like little sponges. They're soaking up things all the time. Don't fight with them over a math problem. That doesn't mean they're exempt from ever doing work and showing work, but sometimes I do just know it. Uh, let's see. Sometimes, or I still need to acquire basic knowledge. Absolutely. They still need to learn multiplication tables. My students still learned all 50 states, capitals, and countries. Drove me crazy. You need to know where China is. I'm sorry. That's your learning, okay? Basic knowledge. You still need it. Now you can probably memorize it more quickly and we can get through it faster, but you still got to do it. Uh, let's see. Novelty is important for gifted kids. I like to talk about tricking them into writing, tricking them into activities. I love project and problem-based learning because it throws so many curves into it. Fun, weird stories. I mean, it's, I think back to when we taught history and we learned about the Vikings and what they really did and all kinds of fun things. So they enjoyed it. Let's see. Don't stop me from questioning things. This is something that my spiral notebooks helped as well with the kids in the classroom. So you see, I don't know, I got to go around to many, many, many schools. And it was just really sad to see some of these younger kids just not thrilled with being there. They're, you know, walking to art and it's sad and they're back and forth. Not that they need to be running wild, but what, what are we doing to the kids where they're not enjoying learning? There's something wrong. The teacher's probably not enjoying teaching, I would argue. But gifted kids, like I said, are like sponges when they're young, okay? They have questions. Honor their questions. That doesn't mean that you have to disrupt the whole class for the two kids who have to have 25 different questions every time, but we want them questioning. It shows they're thinking, they're making connections. And yes, you can have that conversation if it's just coming across as being silly, okay? But for those kids who have a lot, they get it one or two. In my class, they had to write them down. That's another question journal. Write down your questions, write down your questions. 
The trick is by the end of the period, as a teacher, you have to come ask them. You want to honor that thinking. Okay, I want my kids questioning things all the time, even if at the time it annoyed me. You want them questioning. So that was on me by the end of class. Okay, who had questions in the question journal? Most of the time, they're good, but they know I honored it. Okay, very important. Um, I'll, number 18, connections, connections, connections. When it comes down to setting up a classroom environment, making connections with the kids, I would say is number one for their success. If they're enjoying the learning that they're doing, they know you want what's best for them, things are differentiated according to their mean, needs, you're having that relationship, they'll pass any standardized test, they will be happy, they will be fine. It's when we let all these other things get in the way of that. So I'm not saying you have to do like two months at the beginning of the school year, kumbaya and, you know, hold hands and whatnot and crazy icebreakers, but get to know your students. You can do that through writing. You can do that through Socratic discussions and all of those kinds of things. It doesn't have to be silly fluff. Take your time, get to know those kids. Um, lastly, number 20, and then we'll get to some questions. As we're going through this book, this was the only chapter we really, as the three, dug in and took a while to hash out and didn't really agree. So the 50-50 rule is, as you're trying to design gifted programs, we would say half the emphasis and time should be spent on academics, half should be spent on that social and emotional. I would argue it should be 80-20 in favor of social and emotional. If these kids are gifted, they have the scores to prove it, we know they have that potential above all of their peers. If we're putting them in a right environment where they're making connections, feeling safe, having their needs met, the academics will come. Okay. And if I had time, I would tell you a story here about teachers in a highly gifted program who are making kids spend six weeks on test prep. And they didn't like me when I squashed that. But we need to think about the kids first. They're gifted. The academics will come. We have the data on that. So. Uh, just some quick tips. If your kid's struggling, easy things, who cares where they're seated? Who cares if they need a bing bag, a wobbly chair, if they need to doodle while they're paying attention? I sat here and fidgeted with a pin the whole time I was talking. Who cares? As long as it's not being disruptive, let them do those kinds of things. Hopefully you learned something new. There's something more you want to explore more about, and you got a better understanding of your kids. If you need to reach me, there's my email website. Um, yep, email website, different things I do. Some of my books, I just came out with two twice exceptional books with uh, my friend Lynn, who's president of Sing. Um, so that's QR codes for those. I have, we have one for parents and another one for teachers that literally just came out this week on Amazon. So that's my presentation. Awesome, thank you, Adam. That was a lot of info and I feel like I would love to, I need to definitely go back and, and so much of what you said was just like very similar to my experience as a gifted educator um, and what, the stuff that I have observed. Um, and I thought, you know, when you introduced your topic, you talked about, you know, those kiddos that by the time they got to middle school were so disenchanted with education and so disengaged. Yes. And Colorado, um, and probably like Arizona, you have a highly um, diverse population. Mm -hmm. And we know that we are under identifying um, our non-white populations of students. And we know that we're under, under identifying students of poverty. Yes. And when we think about kids who are at risk for um, dropping out, we think about um, a lot of times some of our students who come from disadvantaged homes and who, but we also have to think about how does that under identification of those kiddos come into play with those statistics of gifted kids who leave school early, mm -hmm. you know? And I thought that was really interesting when we talked, you talked about how th those kids struggle to engage in education. Um, that really kind of struck me. I think that's super important. Um, but other than that observation, I do have a couple questions for you that came in the chat. And we do have about 10 minutes left. So if anybody has um, any questions they'd like to add, other than the ones that have already been listed, I'm happy to entertain those. Um, 
But our first question comes from Amber. And she has um, two daughters, uh, one of fraternal twins, one is gifted and identified in a higher level math class and literature class, but yet still seems to be disengaged and, and bored. And that irritability is transitioning to home. And Amber's question is, do you think it's um, something we, she should address with a therapist or should she be looking at changing programs? Well, what, what was the daughter's age? 11. Well, 11 starting that fun kind of time for girls. They kind of start a little early with their maturing and that could definitely be part of that. I remember fifth, sixth grade girls, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that could, I mean, def, there could be a lot going on. So I think number one is keep open communication with your daughter plural make sure that no matter what they can always come to you and tell you what's going on you'll always love them and respect them a lot of times you assume they know that you need to reiterate it frequently especially as they get into middle school um so it, it could definitely be a programming thing it is that i would ask another question when did the start um when we get to this age level, a lot of times peers have a lot to do with this kind of thing and what's cool, what's not cool. We start worrying about fitting in a bit more. Um, so it, it could be a few things. It could be a lack of challenge. She needs to sit down and really have a discussion with her daughter and see, and it might be a discussion ongoing for a while till she really opens up because it could be something totally, you know, out of the blue. I've talked to so many families and just you hear these stories of I had no clue my daughter did this and I didn't hear about it till years later or, or I wish you know I didn't realize it was this bad and I wish I pulled my child to this other program. Um, if you're looking at different programs you really need to have her buy in especially at this age if you want her to be successful. Um, it definitely could be the programming. I mean if it's just not challenging enough or um, intellectually stimulating because there's different ways we can do things. I mean, there are programs out there that are just more rigor, kind of like an AP, and some kids do great with that. Some of them are gifted, some aren't. Um, but a lot of gifted kids just want that creativity and that freedom to kind of learn what they want to learn. You know, especially younger gifted kids, they want to learn what they want to learn. Um, you know, each year I always have like a group of kids with something, you know, like the Titanic was one year and I'm like, I learned more about the darn Titanic than I ever wanted to, as I try to appease them and get them to do <laughs> work and, you know, how you can tie the Titanic into everything. But so it could be a lot of different things. So I would say number one is communication, consistent, make sure that she knows you want what's best and you're willing to be open-minded and explore different options but it, it could be a lot of things. Don't be afraid of looking um, for a therapist if you think it, it, it is getting that bad. Um, I think one of the few thing, one of the few silver linings with the pandemic is we're more aware of mental health mm -hmm. and people are more aware of being open to that and receiving help for that. So I'm glad you're thinking about it and open to that. It, it, so just talk with her um you know, internet's great for finding good resources and things if it, you need to go that route because that may be what she needs but you don't know till you talk to her more i guess good advice thank you adam and i think she also kind of followed up um amber asked another question um following up and you mentioned earlier in your presentation a little bit about twice exceptionality oh. mm -hmm. and she said um how does this maybe correlate and the 20 things correlate with gifted and ADHD? It, the twice exceptionalism for sure is, I don't know, I tend to go where I feel like I'm most in need where I can advocate. So that's what brought me into gifted. And that now honestly is why I'm shifting to twice exceptional and doing more and more research on that um what these kids have to go through when there's i won't say those are extremes but you're dealing with both ends of the spectrum it it's really hard for them in the system to have those needs met so um one of the things 
I practiced when I was in my district and we talk about in our series of books now is we always lead with strength. So they are gifted first. Even within a large district, gifted services came first, special ed came alongside and helped and supported, but we never took a kid out of their area of what do I want to say, their gift or their area that they're good at, they enjoy to spend more time focusing on something that they struggle with. That's just not a good recipe for motivating children to stay engaged in the, in the school system. So this all factors in a lot of it again comes down to that communication getting to know your kids being open i mean if they're really if i don't know if i'm being too general but if they're really struggling in that particular area still and aren't getting their needs met that's a conversation at least with special ed services you have paths you have documents you have things you can go to for help but twice exceptional it's going to be a lot of learning of how to understand everybody's different. Some things are going to be easier. Some things are going to be more difficult. And that's the same with everyone to a certain degree. Um, so I think I, did I answer that? Yes, you did, you did, <laughs> you did. Um, let's see, I've got one more thing just popped up in here. It's a little bit long, so it's going to take me a second to read it. Um, Let's see, um, how do we get gifted boys to do writing if they don't like it? I teach English too. So I would second this question, no, I'm kidding. But okay. seriously, like you mentioned writing being a struggle. How, what are, what are some ways we can motivate them or interest them in writing that might be more effective? Yes, apparently my dog was gonna help with that one. Awesome. But, <laughs> I would say make it as fun as possible. I would do lots of short writing prompts every day when they come in my room, they would have some different crazy story, some story starter, weird things that that's that kind of novelty piece and kind of trick them into a lot of shorter writes, then really helping them through that brainstorming process and going through to where they're handwriting a paper and turning it in or typing it, making sure that they're not super long that you're focusing on one or two things in particular to try to help them kind of narrow down through that process. Because a lot of it probably is avoidance, just because it's not fun for them to try to organize everything, get it down, and then be judged on what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the things I like mastery learning for writing. Like even with my books, it's I'm always finding typos and edits and things I want to change or add, even when it's out there they need to realize the final draft is not the final draft either. And that's just where we can talk through things and support them through their thoughts. But yeah, I would say trick them into fun writing assignments, get them writing them all the time, and to try to get other teachers to do it in different subject areas and not nitpick them on all of them. They're just writing starts becoming more of a flow. The more they write, the easier it'll be for that brain hand coordination, that kind of thing. And I would say that's that's what's been successful for me as well. I feel like I've gotten the most engaged and hilarious writing responses with visual prompts and cues. Yeah, that they can that like leave options open for them to to interpret, and then being told, "Hey, tell me about this setting in the most descriptive way possible," or "Tell me about um, what the dialogue, what dialogue's happening here." I had just people sitting at a meeting one time, and I said, "What's the dialogue?" And you could not imagine what these high these high school boys wrote about this business meeting turning into somebody got fired. It was, it was, and, and they were so into it that they wanted to act out the scene in front of class. And you let them, I hope. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. One thing too, I'll, I'll throw in one thing. If you haven't seen it, it's been around a while. The book, The Mysterious Her Mysteries of Harris Burdick. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. It's black and white. You can make copies of it on the machine. I don't know if you're allowed to, but I did. And it's, just weird pictures and the kids have to draw what's the story with this whatever it is just weird interesting unique engaging pictures that the kids can write a fun story and then share all the different ideas again you're making it fun you're making it a game you're not nitpicking the final output yeah it, it definitely choices 
choice is helpful too. Choice and comedy, <laughs> those seem to be the things that hook them in the most. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for tonight. I think we, we've run on time at 6.01 and we have answered all the questions. And I think there's so much information shared in this presentation, Adam, that I think I definitely wanna make sure that we redirect our um, members to coloradogifted.org. Um, this presentation will be, because it's being recorded, it will be shared um, on our website under the resources tab, conversations with CAGT. And then we will, um, you know, hopefully they'll access all of the books and information, those QR codes you share, this a wealth of resources. So, oh, and my daughter just got home from hip hop dance. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, it was great to have you tonight, Adam, and great to have everybody join us tonight. Um, we've got one more presentation coming up on the 16th. Um, with PJ Cedillo. He is going to be talking about cultural responsiveness for gifted and talented LGBTQ plus students. So rounding out our year with that presentation. And again, Adam, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, my pleasure.